Hi, I'm uh, Andy Worthington. Uh, this is Timothy Anderson, Lorenzo Lucchese, Matty Markham, and Lucas Vasconcelos, and together we are the uh, Scenario Robotics team. Today we're going to go over the background of our project, our design requirements, our mechanical, electrical, and software designs, the design of our control system that we've implemented, descriptions of our tests, <laughs> uh, summary of our results, and uh, we'll look at the semester in review and then look at the questions. So some background on this project. Um, we are not the first team to work on this project. Uh, back in 2016, uh, Nuru Murali Duran, uh, Dr. Eisenberg, uh, Dr. Gentilini, they put together an advanced simulation of this uh, Cartesian manipulator with a force torque sensor on top of that and a little robot mounted on top of that. The little robot in this simulation wiggles around and generates interesting content for the force torque sensor, which this big robot um, drives those forces and torques down to zero and simulates a free-floating environment uh, in this simulation. This was kind of a breakthrough and is the basis for our project. It uh, doesn't end there. Um, they compared their simulation to their simulation and came back in 2018 uh, with an experimental validation of their results. They actually put this uh, little robot on a Cartesian manipulator. This is the Harada that we use, actually, and we'll explain it more in, uh, later on in the presentation. Um, but they actually were able to develop a force feedback algorithm um, on hardware and compare it uh, to their simulation um, from their experimental data. It wasn't perfect. They had some issues in the, uh, the frequency of their control algorithm. And, uh, and some drift, but it was there, it was a start, and it was, uh, it was on hardware. Project Scenario plans to take it to the next level. Uh, we actually developed this planar space robot. Um, this is gonna go on an air bearing table, which is already a, uh, a verified free-floating frictionless environment. And so this will serve as our control experiment. Uh, we then mount the same robot on a robotic platform with a force torque sensor, and driving those forces and torques down to zero, we actually will compare our data from our robotic platform to our uh, air bearing table. So in this way, we compare our experimental data uh, to our experimental data and uh, generate an error between those. This is important because in the future, um, this technology could be adapted to a six degree of freedom full space implementation on the ground uh, instead of just a planar three degree of freedom uh, two translations and a rotation. Um, so this is hopefully where the project is going after uh, we all move on. As far as success for this project goes, it depends on our robotic platform's control law. Um, we are going to wiggle on the air bearing table and with an identical wiggle on the Harada robot, we should see identical motion between those. The robot should perfectly move itself to simulate a free-floating space environment. And now that we've gotten through all that, I'm gonna pass it off to Tim. He's gonna talk about our design requirements. Thank you, Andy. Uh, so in case uh, anyone's unfamiliar, I'd like to just clarify how we define requirements and specifications. In our case, requirements are, these are high-level things that the customer would give to us that uh, we're hoping to meet with our product. And specifications, we define those later. Those are the numerical things that we design towards in order to meet the requirements. Dr. Davis, did you need some slides? Okay. Um, so getting started, uh, Andy mentioned this in the, um, the kind of the definition of project success is its first requirement, the robotic platform should simulate free-floating motion. That's really the big idea. Second requirement, uh, we're gonna be doing this using a Harada manipulator as the base of our robotic platform. You'll notice that this requirement, um, as well as a few others, have very specific hardware um, that we're meant to be using. That's because this is the hardware that has already been purchased by the university, is already used for this project. So that's what we're designing on. This robotic platform is gonna operate in a three degree of freedom, a specifically planar environment and it's gonna be actuated by the motors and encoders that we already have in the lab for this project. And there's a picture of one of them there. Um, of course, we're gonna be, uh, we need to acquire encoder data, so we know that um, for all of our motors on the PSR and the Harada, uh, as well as force and torque data from the uh, force torque sensor picture there on the right. Um, we wanna do this at a very high frequency, uh, and that sensor specifically is the ATI Mini 40, which also uh, was used previously in this project. In addition, we're using the motion capture system that's already installed in the robotics lab uh, to uh, capture our uh, air bearing table test uh, for verification. Um, in terms of our software, of course, our software needs to implement the controller that is going to uh, produce that free floating motion. And then also we would like to have, uh, we need to have a user interface uh, so that people unfamiliar with the project or, or coming onto it later can easily pick it up creating two planar space robots, and one of them is here. Um, they need to have identical dynamical property. 
employees uh, so that we can accurately compare uh, their behavior. Uh, they need to have a minimum of four physical links each uh, to produce interesting uh, motion content for our system. Uh, in addition, we need to have an actuator for attitude control as this uh, we are looking to simulate some sort of space robot or satellite robot. Uh, in order to eliminate external forces and torques acting on the robot, uh, we have all of our electronics on board, power on board, <coughs> air supply is on board, and we use wireless communications. In addition to operate on the air bearing table, we need to have functional air bearings, and so that's our final requirement. I now hand it off to Lorenzo to cover our mechanical design. Thank you, Tim. So let's jump right in. So a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to have a high level sort of give you guys an idea of how big this really is. As you can see, the space robot is relatively big. So the Harada manipulator is going to be a little bit bigger than that. After that, we're going to go into specific design elements of the PSR, as you can see there, and then also some challenges and recommendations that I have from a mechanical um, engineering point of view. So first, the dimensions of the PSR are ranging from a meter by about a third of a meter to uh, about Four tenths of a meter. Um, for those of you who love feet and inches, I included those as well. <laughs> um, but relatively, you can look in there and those dimensions line up with the planar space robot. As for the Harada, which couldn't be here today, um, we have um, same sort of dimensions. Length represents basically that last link that you can see here. Width is in the page and obviously height. And then the two mounted together. So granted here you can't see the motors, the dimensions for the Harada include the um, axon motors that are mounted um, respectively to each axis. But um, this, is, this is the dimension for that. As you can tell, it's slightly bigger than what's there, so this project as a whole is relatively large. So now let's dive into the PSR, what we designed ourselves, and um, some design elements that are included in that. So first is the air bearing mount. This is basically the bottommost section of our planar space robot. The base is constructed of aluminum, bar stock, and also um, water jetted plate. Uh, the three point of contact formed by a Y um, allows our air bearings to basically create a plane and therefore um, remain stable when it moves around. Um, and also the center mounting hub, as you can see here, this aluminum piece right here, is uh, permits mounting to the Harada manipulator. And then on top of that, you can see the um, 3D printed um, PLA um, coupler, and that permits the base to be mounted to the PSR itself, the remaining body of the PSR. Next, we're going to talk about the structural frame. So the structural frame consists of two parts, the aluminum S shape, which you can see here, as well as two um, supporting posts that are printed from with PLA. So the whole point of this S shape design um, is primarily to free up the center. Um, it didn't necessarily need to be an S shaped, but um, it looked cool. And then also, <laughs> also um, it also frees up the center space. So we can actually put stuff in the center. A straight beam design would have allowed this as well. But in the end, we decided to move forward with the gas to uh, promote you know, uniqueness and you can move forward with, with a longer design. Um, next is the momentum wheel station. So what goes in the center of that structural frame is the momentum wheel station. It's been entirely printed using PLA, uh, repeating pattern. Um, as you can see here, there are bearing rods here. Those were fabricated in shop or on campus. And um, we use um, bearings to basically reduce the friction in our links. Um, inside of here, you can see there is a, another motor inside of there. That is our momentum uh, wheel motor. There is no mass. As of right now, we do not have a momentum wheel mass, but we are uh, going to move forward with that. And um, once designed, we just need to implement that. Um, as you can see, there were three sections to the momentum wheel station, a top plate, which hosts the bearing rods, the middle plate, which allows for the mounting of the momentum wheel motor, and also the bottom plate, which is, acts as the mounting point for the motors. The whole reason why the momentum wheel motor is in the center of this momentum wheel station is that we hope to align the spinning mass of the momentum wheel with the Z axis of the robot. So by doing that, you can basically allow all your torques generated by that momentum wheel to be acted upon on the z-axis, rather than out on a limb, you can control the resultant um, excitation of the robot better. Um, the momentum wheel station also acts as the first um, part of our dual linkages. So as for the first link in our linkage or arm, um, 
can see that there are three or four primary parts. We have a top plate, a bottom plate, a motor um, shaft clasping part, and then um, the main body. So the whole point of having four separate components is basically to facilitate construction. You don't have to squeeze the motor in and well, you gotta get the motor in. After you get the motor in, you can wrap the rest of the pieces around the previous motor on the momentum wheel station. So you don't have to get one part in and try to squeeze the next link onto that. You can kind of um, put it piece to piece and kind of sandwich around it rather than having like go under it, clamp on top, all that kind of stuff. As for the second linkage, it's basically the same, printed with BLA, except that we have this nice um, end gripper here. So we rounded out the end gripper, or made it round, so that we can um, have a single point of contact for further research. If um, the next, if the next, another capstone team decides to use a robot, they can actually grip onto um, objects and you know take it to the next step. If you have a planar space robot that kind of floats around, that's nice. But the next step would be to actually be able to interact with the surroundings or an object in space and be able to manipulate that object. So now that we have two links, we have the momentum wheel station, how do we align those links to make sure that we can accurately repeat our tests? So this is done with an alignment beam, as you can see here. It consists of a PLA grip and two raw bar stock, uh, aluminum bar stock. It basically serves as a, um, a tool to align the link so that the encoders can start from the same position every time as they are not smart enough to know um, absolute position, they only know relative to where they start. <coughs> so finally, or next, we have the electronic station. It is printed using PLA yet again and installed and is installed above that structural frame. It is constructed using five components. We have the wall, we have the two mid plates here and here, and then the bottom and top uh, caps. So to go into the wall, it has the primary feature of the wall is that we have our base our control panel. So it has two LEDs, a go and a fail, and then an on-off switch. And then also it has placement guides for our PCB and our Arduino. So our Arduino um, is basically mounts to our PCB board and then we use standoffs to um, separate it from the box so the Arduino isn't making unwanted connections with the base of the um, base of the electronic station. And then it slides in using these slots and dimensions such that there's enough freedom that you can drop it in and then it sits nice and um, flat on the bottom and it's not tweaked or any unwanted you know, disbalance inside of the electronic station. Next we have the mid plates. Uh, these mid plates were designed to also serve as um, mounting points for our air tanks. Um, by having those air tanks up at the electronic station it removes any likelihood of a collision between the links and the air tanks themselves. Previous design iterations had the tanks lower and it actually uh, limited our workspace and that if um, we wanted to move the arm inward, it would have actually collided with the tanks. Um, that would have limited our workspace, so we decided to move those up. Uh, as for the top cap, uh, now that we have air tanks, we need an air regulation system and also a filter before that air goes out to our air bearings. So in order to basically mount that um, filter and regulator, we have a slot for the filter to slide through and also a uh, small cavity or a nook for the, um, for the regulator to um, place, slide into place. And then also a mounting um, apparatus so that we can basically make sure that those don't fall out and scratch or damage our air bearing cable. Um, Holes on top allow for or having those um, component external to the body of the robot allows for quick uh, recharging of the air tanks and also monitoring of the uh, air pressure. If the pressure drops below 40 psi, we start hearing noises with our bearings, and that's undesirable. Um, the as for the bottom cap of the electronic station, uh, this is the entry point for all of our wires. As you can see, all the wires kind of funnel through the bottom of the robot. Um, these uh, cavities or holes had to be big enough for the Phoenix connectors on the end of the motor wires as well as for fingers to get in. If we need to hard reset the Arduino and hit that reset button, we need to be able to get a finger in there and not you know, have to take the whole robot apart as time when an Arduino is running code and the integrators are piling up and something's going wrong. You can't necessarily 
take the robot apart. So being able to get a finger in there and click the reset buttons, um, very advantageous. So as for the air tanks, as I said before, those are attached to the uh, mid place of the electronic station. Those were purchased, not made in house as was proposed in our preliminary design. Um, each one of those has a capacity of 0.21 gallons, which adds up to 0.42. Um, they are currently compressed at 95 PSI. That is the pressure off the wall in the robotics laboratory. They have a maximum pressure way above 3,000 PSI. Uh, however, we're not able to purchase an air compressor or get our hands on one, so we were operating at um, charging our tanks to 95 and then regulating down to 60. Um, that permitted a runtime of only one minute, and this will be seen later how we can improve that in my recommendation. Finally, the air regulation system consists of the regulator with the knob and the filter, the white, and was installed on top of the cap or into the cap as I previously described. Those were both purchased, and also, um, as I previously said, regulated down to 60 PSI, while also, um, Regulates down to 60 PSI from the wall pressure of 95 so that our air bearings can operate at 60. So let's go into the challenges and recommendations that I believe could really further this project in the future as well as some uh, challenges that could be addressed later on. So first, um, primary challenge was designing with accessibility in mind, making sure those holes for the fingers are big enough and then also being able to get to all the bolts. So assembly and disassembly um, could have been, was quite difficult to begin with. I had to reprint quite a few parts to make sure that accessibility was there so that rather than having to take the whole robot apart to access one small part, you can only take apart part of it. Um, so that includes the assembly, <laughs> disassembly, necessary repairs, as well as the electronic resets. Um, as for the motors, clasping onto the motor shaft was quite difficult. I went through several design iterations from a, um, initially a set screw to a key for the shaft and then finally to a pulley. Um, we found that that would be the easiest uh, mechanism as all you need is the two bolts and then you basically tighten up around that shaft and then from there you're ready to set and go. You don't have any damage to the shaft over time from a set screw. Um, finally, there's required strength versus desired weight. As the infill increases, your weight increases. However, you get more strength. So finding a balance between, since everything was 3D printing, finding a balance between weight and um, strength was quite difficult. Some recommendations. I would recommend a redesign of the top um, uh, cap of the electronic station. Basically, it's really hard to align the um, regulator and the filter so that they're straight and in the same vertical plane, I guess you can say, so they can slide in. It took a lot of finicking with tape to make that happen. Um, but in the future, that could be redesigned to be better adapted to you know, imperfections in the alignments of those two components, it'd be great. Um, lighter air tanks, um, those are, as I previously said, are made out of steel, very heavy, um, six pounds total. Our whole frame by itself without those tanks is six pounds, so being able to drop those down uh, in weight and use carbon fiber would have been a great um, improvement. However, we were not able to do this. Um, improved air regulator. Right now, um, you can only regulate down from 120 PSI is the maximum pressure this air regulator can take. Uh, having that be higher, considering our air tanks can go well above 3,000 PSI, would have greatly increased our runtime. Thank you, and now I'm gonna hand it off to Maddie Markham to talk about the electrical design of the PSI. Thanks, Bill. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the electrical design, as Lorenzo said, of the PSR. So we'll jump right into the DC motor block diagram. We do have four links, so we have four DC motors running on each link, plus a momentum wheel, which is also a DC motor. So we actually have five identical circuits running. So everything does swim from our, stem from our microprocessor, which is an Arduino Do. It was one of the only Arduinos that could handle the amount of pins that we needed. So you do have five or four DPIO pins plus a PWM pin used to drive these DC motors. They go into a motor driver through that DC motor and an encoder included on those DC motors. And then we didn't want to um, have our Arduino do uh, have the task of decoding all of that information and using so many interrupts. So we did use decoder circuits in the form of PICs instead. The Arduino do is powered by 12 volts. 
but the encoders and the decoders are powered by five volts, so we did need to regulate down on board since we needed all the power to be on board. And our, to um, fulfill our wireless capability requirement, we do have a Wi-Fi module, which is an XP Series 1. It has an antenna on it. So we have two UART pins coming from the Arduino View, the TX and RX, and that is powered by 3.3 volts, which is an onboard regulator on that Arduino View. Moving on to the schematic, you see the same thing. We have our brushed DC motor with that encoder, channel A and B data going back to the decoder, and then GPIO pins to our Arduino View on this side. And then our PWM, our speed and direction for the flow and motor drivers going in there. On the top, you see our bypass capacitors for everywhere that we have power going into a component. And on the right, you see an example of a do pin out. We do have 25 pins going to those DC motors. And then we have our two UART pins as well as the LED indicator pins coming from that Arduino. So we have an Excel spreadsheet with about 40 lines of all of those pin outs. So this is just an example of motor one. Um, we used this and we updated it, different revisions to keep track as we were breadboarding and going through the printed circuit board design. For power regulation, Lorenzo did mention that we implemented a switch this semester. We didn't want our battery running continuously. We wanted to be able to switch it on and off to be able to save some battery power. So we do need to regulate down to the five volts, as I mentioned. We're using a CUI regulator. It's a simple three pin compatible LDO replacement, but it's much more efficient than an LDO. And it does have a max current output of two amps, which is sufficient for our purposes in this case. And the capacitors that you see are required for regulator stability. Those were provided by the data sheet for each of supply. For breadboarding, we did want to have complete um, confidence in our design before we made a printed circuit board. So we did breadboard the entire system. So first we breadboarded all of the motors, but we ran one at a time to make sure that each motor circuit was running correctly. We tested the current draws with the power supply, making sure that we weren't ever exceeding too much current. And then we finally ran every single motor at the same time, again, to make sure that we weren't exceeding current draw and that all of them were working simultaneously. Um, lastly, the battery regulator and switch were implemented once we were sure of those current draws. Um, as you'll see in the next slide, breadboarding was not reasonable inside the robot. For this case, there's too many pins, too many wires. So we did need a custom printed circuit board. Here is the breadboard. It is color coded. We color coded every signal, but as you can see, it's still a mess of wires. Um, so we triple checked this, three people checked over it before we actually sent anything. Um, you can see all of our five motors working, but it's obviously not reasonable to put this inside of a robot. You need a circuit board. So moving on to the printed circuit board, um, this is our final design. This has gone through many design iterations. It is a two-layer board with a ground fill on top and bottom, and ground is connecting the top and bottom grounds. The red traces that you see are going to be on the top of the board, while the blue traces are going to be on the bottom. We followed standard printed circuit board design rules. Nothing, none of the traces are parallel to each other on the top and the bottom to eliminate the risk of parasitic capacitance. All of the bypass capacitors are placed as close to the um, components as possible on that printed circuit board as well, and then you can see our Phoenix connectors coming into the side, the traces go from our components out to the connectors and then out to those DC motors. Um, one of the major design iterations that we went through this semester, the Arduino Do was originally going to be stacked on the bottom of the printed circuit board, and then we were going, or on the top of the circuit board, and an XB shield was going to be used to connect to the XB Wi-Fi module. We actually discovered the XB module wasn't very compatible with the Arduino Do in this case, so we had to Completely changed that. The whole circuit board changed, and you can actually see here's where the XP goes down. So that's a pretty big component that we had to make space for on this circuit board. First board spins, we did manufacture two boards on campus and tested the layout of all of our components. So this was our second one. Um, you can see we laid out all of the motor drivers, all the Phoenix connectors, and the XP Wi-Fi module. The Arduino Do is actually on the bottom of it as well. One of the major changes we made after milling our first board on campus was our Arduino do stuck out too far from the board, so it wasn't going to fit reasonably inside the main body of that robot. And so the next iteration, we moved that inside a little bit and then milled another one to test the layout. We made measurements, made sure that it fit inside the robot before we uh, milled commercially. The final board was the seventh revision, so this went through two iterations last semester, quite a bit this semester, we wanted to be completely sure that it was going to work, so multiple changes were made on that. 
here is the final board, and I think it's headed around. So we did order three boards from Oshpark, and we used headers to connect to the Arduino Do as well as the motor drivers. This allowed us the ease to switch out components and also to unplug that Arduino Do if we needed to reprogram it. Uh, the boards, as I said, were stacked on top of the Arduino Do you can see on the bottom, and then there's um, the whole stack that Lorenzo talked about that sits inside the robot. Um, as I said, the Snap and Phoenix connectors were used to connect to each DC motor. This was easier than using the screw in ones. We didn't have to get in and unscrew every single wire every time that we wanted to take the board out and test something. Some challenges that we encountered. We probably violated the number one rule of circuits and shorted power to ground <laughs> on, the, <laughs> on the first board. So solder actually congealed underneath one of the surface mount capacitors and shorted power to the ground. And that's one of the boards that you see uh, floating around, the thick power trace actually lifted off of the board, and had we needed to, we could have fixed that, we could have wire jumped around it, but luckily we had two extra boards, as I mentioned, we ordered three and we had two robots. So the parts were swapped to a new board, and then quickly after that, the regulator on board failed. So the <laughs> regulator on board overheated and actually shorted the 12 volts, the five volts and ground all together inside that regulator. This then caused all of our motor drivers to fail on that board. So luckily we did have those on headers. We ordered new motor drivers. Uh, Leonard, if you were wondering about our last minute purchases. Um, so we swapped all of those motor drivers and then we tested on the board and the board was successful once all of the new components were put on there. The second board did have one broken motor driver. Uh, once that was swapped, the board was successful. So in hindsight, our motor drivers caused us a lot of issues towards the end. So here's a picture of that board that's floating around. You can see that thick copper trace has pulled up off of the board and is a little burnt. And then on the other side, you see our graveyard of motor drivers and our momentum wheel and our, our burn regulator. So troubleshooting how we overcame some of this, test, test, and test again. We used a multimeter to continuity test all of the connections on the boards before powering them up. The motor, we also constructed a motor driver test circuit in order to verify that the motor drivers were working outside of the printed circuit board before we implemented them. So this is what we were having the most trouble with towards the end of the project. So an Arduino you do was used to implement a simple code and then a load was applied and then we looked at that output on a scope trace to make sure that it was actually what we wanted. We were getting the square width out of those motor drivers that we anticipated. Um, and then finally, the circuit board was powered off the power supply, and we used a multimeter to test every voltage drop and all of the connections before we implemented it into the battery. Here's a picture of that uh, test circuit. So we do have the resistive load and then our Arduino Uno running through those motor drivers. Um, some of them appeared to be working before we built this test circuit, and when we looked at it on a scope, it was actually complete nonsense and not a square wave like we anticipated. So even though they seemed to be working, if they were Unfortunately not. So this was one way that we got around that to ensuring that they were correct. I will now hand it off to Lucas to talk about the Harada electronic device. Thank you, Mary. First of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, as I mentioned, my name is Lucas. I'm going to be talking about the electrical design uh, for the robotic platform and a little bit about the battery uh, specific calculations. So first of all, for the PSR, we, as Mary already said, we had to do some calculations. And from the preliminary design, we were able to calculate that the current draw that the battery was, uh, was needed to be to run a total amount of 30 minutes was about 1.38 amp hour. Uh, once we had that, that value, we were then uh, finally able to choose our battery, which is shown uh, on, that, on this figure right here, which provided 11.1 volts, a 2.2 amp, uh, amp hour current, and then uh, a 24.4 watts hour. Uh, after some testing and after running a sequence of uh, tests on the PSR, we were able to, to finally conclude that that battery was, was enough. Uh, now, moving on to the Hirata. Uh, so the Hirata General Driving Environment that we have here, uh, I'm going to go through more in detail on further slides, but I'm just going to go a uh, um, uh, quick overlook over that. So we have our power supply uh, powering up our motor drivers. Those motor drivers are connected through channel A and B uh, to our DC motors. They already uh, have the encoders on them. Those encoders are connected to channel A and B to our decoders, which are provided for by Dr. Uh, Eisenberg, which are the PICs. Uh, those decoders are connected to reset, data, and shift to our channel two or our, uh, one of our 80 link cards, which is our uh, digital input output. 
Uh, that digital input output channel two is also receiving data from our limit sensors through data, and then uh, uh, a VD and a ground. And then uh, over here we have our motor drive is also uh, sending that direction in PWM, receiving that direction in PWM from optimizer layers that are connected to our microprocessors. I'm gonna go through and explain why do we need optimizer layers and why do we need microprocessors on further slides. And uh, they are connected to our uh, digital input channel one, digital input output channel one, which is uh, outputting their direction PWM and speed. Uh, on the, this little diagram right here, we have our four stroke sensor, uh, which is uh, our trend transducer, which is producing our analog signal. That transducer is sending that analog signal to our uh, data acquisition transducer power supply, which is uh, uh, conditioning the analog signal and then providing the analog signal to our data acquisition uh, edit link card. That's going to be changing the analog signal to a digital signal for the PC. So, uh, our, how do our motor drives interfer, uh, interface with our DI, uh, digital input output card? So, uh, those optimized layers, we needed them for safety. We wanted to uh, electrical, electrically isolate the, the motor circuit from the PC circuit in order not to cause any damage for the PC. And also, it helped us maintain a, a constant voltage for the PC and also for the motors. Uh, and uh, our microprocessor were, was needed because our di digital input output cards were not able to, uh, to generate a PWM. Therefore, we needed those uh, microprocessors, which was also provided for, by Dr. R, so we could generate that PWM for the motors. Now here's a schematic of our optimizer layers and uh, our microprocessor. Uh, it was uh, designed in Eagle. Uh, as you, we guys can see, we have uh, channel one of our digital input output. Uh, it's outputting uh, uh, enable a select uh, speed and a direction to our microprocessor. And that microprocessor is then producing direction and PWM for our optimizer layers. And those optimizer layers are providing uh, information to our uh, uh, to our motor drivers. <coughs> Uh, it's also good to point out that we have a voltage regulator right here, which is receiving 12 volts from the power supply, and is uh, turning that voltage down to uh, 5 volts and powering on our optimizer layers through this connection. And then we also have those 5 uh, volts right here, which is coming from our uh, channel 1 <coughs> AD link card right here. Right there. And uh, that connection was needed because we have low current here, so we decided to use that, that one. Now, our decoders and sensor interface with our uh, DIO card. So this was mainly our data analysis circuit for, of the RADA. So we have our decoders connected to the motors and encoders to channel A and B. We have our uh, digital input output channel two connected to digital input output uh, channel two to a reset, a shift, and a data. And we also have our limit sensors, which are, are also going to our uh, digital input output channel two. And we also uh, implemented some LED circuit just for testing out and analysis purpose. Here is a, a little circuit of our limit sensor schematic. Uh, as we can see right here, here's our uh, limit sensor circuitry. Uh, as we can see, we have, uh, it's good to point out that we're gonna have two limit sen sensors on uh, from the x-axis and two on the y-axis, on one of each end. Those were uh, software defined as a low and as a high, so then we can uh, have a better idea where, that, where the position of that here is at. And then we have the LED, as I said before, for testing purposes and analysis. And all that data is going through our uh, channel one, no, channel two, sorry. And then here we have our three decoders for our three motors. And uh, as I said before, they're, they are sending data through our channel two, and they're receiving reset. They're receiving back uh, reset and a shift from channel two output, and then they're passing that information back to our encoders on the motors. Uh, through uh, channel A and channel B. And we also had to include those uh, low-pass filters, capacitors, which are circle up there. And those are needed because some of our cables are long and we're creating like a pretty good amount of, of noise. So we had to cancel those out, those low-pass filter capacitors. And we also had to include a bypass capacitors uh, between the source and ground up there. <coughs> now moving on to our force torque interface with the deck cars. So our force torque, as we can see right here, we have our transducer, which was uh, uh, mounted on the Hirata in between the, the Z-axis and our PSR. Uh, that transducer is gonna be sending, as I said before, analog signals to our, de uh, our deck transducer power supply, which is gonna be conditioning, but not tr yet transforming those uh, uh, analog signals to digital. And then, then connected to our uh, data acquisition AD link card to the PC, 
and that data collision car is going to be transforming that analog signal into a digital. <coughs> Although uh, this, uh, this is a perfect setup that we had in the lab, we only had one uh, thing different on the picture. If we did not have this uh, cable that goes straight out of our, uh, our transducer power supply to our data collision car, so we had to, uh, to get a pin out and by to analyze, analyzing data sheets, we're able to create our own uh, breakout board in between that and connect those two together. Now here's uh, the Hirata final setup. Uh, we have our motor drivers, uh, we have our decoder sensors right here, our auto isolator and microprocessor, and we also have a kill switch which was implemented by, uh, for safety of the circuit. That kill switch is implemented between our uh, source, source ground and our, all, all of our motor drivers ground. So whenever we press that kill switch, all the motor drivers uh, turn off and then there's no, no voltage going anywhere. So here's a video. Here's our video of Ariana testing. Uh, at the date that we implemented this, we only still had a spring constant KP implemented. As you guys can see, uh, it only moves whenever we apply some kind of force on it. So there's no drift yet. And we, as you guys also can see, the PSR was not uh, on top of it yet. <coughs> so uh, moving on, we have uh, challenging improvements. The main challenge that we faced throughout the Hirata was a ground problem in the Hirata. So after some analysis on our kill switch, uh, we had a ground that was overlapping, so it was uh, passing that, uh, was overlapping our kill switch. Therefore, whenever we're pressing the kill switch, our motor drivers were still able to run. After some multimeter uh, testing and uh, running some, trying to uh, draw all the schematic back again and trying to figure out what, what was going on, we are able to define that the, the PWM, the ground, uh, the, P, the, P, the, P, the ground of the PWM was connected to the ground of the, the source of the motor drivers. Therefore, they're all connected and that, P, uh, that ground was uh, being able to, to overpass our kill switch and still make the, the motor drivers on. Uh, once we figured that out, we just put those grounds all together with the motor drive gun in between in with the kill switch and then we figured we uh, were able to fix that problem. Our next challenge was a broken limit sensor on the Rado I axis. As I said, we were able to, to find out that problem through the LEDs, uh, but just uh, moving to the limits, and then uh, one of the LEDs were, were never turning on, and then we were able to find that that limit sensor was broken, and then Dr. I was able to provide us a lot of, another one, and then after we installed and run some testing again, we were able to verify that, that it was uh, completely functional. Uh, improvements, uh, for the future, I think if a lot more time, we could design a PCB for the Hirata too. As you guys saw in the picture, it's free, a lot, a lot of cables going everywhere. So I feel like uh, it would help us to debug a lot. <coughs> now I'm gonna pass it off to Andy Warbiton and then he's gonna talk about software and control system today. Thanks Lucas. So for the software for the Harada, um, we actually had a little bit of code left over from the previous people who worked on this project. Uh, we didn't end up using much, we used uh, I think 80 lines stayed in out of our 2200 lines of C total. Uh, so it's about three and a half percent, but it was a great start. Uh, we've written it in C, uh, C++ um, as a Windows console application, so it's just a command line. Uh, it's not graphical, but it's very usable. Um, the software does a lot, including uh, parsing our user input, uh, handling all of our motor driving and our sensor reading, um, as well as uh, logging our experimental data, and it's responsible for full force feedback control of our whole system. <coughs> Uh, when we built it, we wanted to design it as safe as possible, so we have uh, multiple layers of safety. In order of uh, sophistication, we have our power supplies, kind of a no-brainer, um, but we always wanted to make sure that we didn't leave the room with the power supply on, or when we were done with it, we turned it off. That was just the first step. Uh, next, we have the kill switch, which uh, broke all of our ground connections, and that's a big red button, you saw it. Um, on, additionally, every loop in this code checks the keyboard, um, and so if you hit the keyboard, it'll break the loop, the motors will be stopped and uh, you'll be back in safe mode. So no matter what, if you panic, as long as the system is running, uh, if things go wrong, you hit any key on the keyboard and it will shut it down. Uh, last but not least, our uh, enable flag. This is a boolean uh, in our code that is only set by uh, one user function. They have to enter the word arm or enable. Um, and this is, uh, this is reset and disabled by our uh, limit sensors and a, uh, a user function as well. But the way, this is, the way this works is it's actually written directly to a motor driver. It's bit shifted in as a, uh, a one or a zero. And if we don't pull this uh, enable pin high, uh, the motor driver shuts down our motor. So um, by default, its default state is, uh, is off. 
Here's a, uh, an example of our console application. This is what happens when you type help or menu. Um, on the left, we have these uh, commands that are designed to be entered in very quickly, so no caps or anything like that. Um, this arms the system and, uh, and has all of its uh, little sub-functions that it can run through. Uh, we do sanitize user input, so if we were to uh, look at VSAT here, if I tried to set our maximum voltage to something silly like 200 volts or negative 20, um, it would not do that. It wouldn't enter anything that would save. Uh, additionally, we have a status indicator for the, uh, if the motors are armed or not, and it will say, waiting for command is cute. Uh, the PSR software is much the same. Uh, most of its tasks include uh, serial communication and parsing data from the Harada workstation. Um, this is also, of course, responsible for uh, logging our experimental data and spewing it back to the Harada, and uh, of course, positional control of our full robotic links. Oops. Uh, this is our uh, PSR console. It has two LED indicators, so in the standby mode, it just oscillates between these two. And these lights indicate that we should be looking for oops and bops on our uh, product console. This just tells us that our system is working well and is waiting for a command. So if we uh, lose this or if we lose that, we know why the image won't fail. Uh, this is an example of our PSR console on the product workstation. So from the PC, you're going to see this. It's more simplified than uh, sending commands to the Harada. Uh, it's just a single character. It is set up um, so that if you tell the system that the uh, the PSR is mounted on top of a robotic platform. When you enter in movement data, it will automatically begin our force feedback control on our PC system. Uh, for uh, control of our PSR, we have a full PID. This is kind of fun to implement. Uh, we use a differentiating low pass filter for our, to get our um, motor rates. And uh, this is important because it kind of smooths out our data. We don't direct differentiate, which I think violates one of the holy grail laws of control. Um, additionally, we use uh, forward-only integrators, which are cheap to calculate and accurate enough for our purposes. I don't think we'd benefit from going to something more accurate. Um, all our filters were designed in the S domain, uh, classical, you know, uh, and then uh, we switched those to the Z domain, and then algebraically moved that to a difference equation and implemented that in our C code. Um, and that was dependent on our having a static frequency, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, some nice features, uh, we did test our motor static friction. So if it lasts about two volts, um, if you enter in two volts, it's not gonna move anyway. So we just cut that out, we're on a, we try to save power, we're on a battery. Um, so we don't let it just heat up unnecessarily. Um, additionally, uh, we turn off our integrators when our input is saturated to prevent wind up. This had a huge impact on our overshoot uh, when we were actually designing the control. For the Harada, we just use a uh, PI right now for force feedback control. We filter our uh, force torque sensor with those same filters as before. Uh, tweaked a little bit. Um, the, uh, the proportional, as you saw in Lucas's video before, allows you to respond to those minute changes in force. I was able to move that with uh, just a finger, whereas if you're actually trying to push the Harada, uh, you have to poke your full weight into it. Um, the, uh, the integral control is nice because it actually simulates that, uh, that space environment. At one point, uh, I harassed the whole team and got him to play Pong with me over his, uh, <laughs> we're pushing this uh, robot back and forth and drift over, and Tim would catch it and push it back, and it made everybody do it, but I had a good time. Um, we have a derivative control as well. Uh, it's not used right now. Um, we'll talk about that in the challenges. Oh, and now challenges. <laughs> our, uh, our controller needs additional tuning. Uh, this is uh, control of an electrical signal. Um, instead of something simple, simple like positional control that we were used to, this was uh, completely different for us, and so um, it's as it stands right now, I know you, you know, it'll never be really done, right? But um, it could benefit from additional tuning uh, in its force torque sensor. And Tim will talk more about our results. Um, the filtering on the force torque sensor was totally necessary, but um, as you saw, when I pushed it before, uh, it was easy to push. But if I were to go up and hit it uh, with an impulse, like a pencil or something, it would reject that entirely because we're filtering at the high frequency noise. Uh, the weight of the air tanks was pretty significant, and the fact that they were up there, a force torque sensor is a spring. Um, and so when, uh, when it, it has a tendency to wobble, and with a high enough uh, spring constant in our control system, it will try to chase that wobble, and it could, it could go unstable. I have a video for you. Additionally, um, the derivative control we messed around with, but uh, we got some good, uh, good results with low uh, KV gains, um, but when we bumped those up, it really had a potential to go unstable, and it was a fine line, so we eventually ended up taking it off. It's ready to be implemented again, um, but it just needs to be tuned.
This video is of our air tank vibration. You can see the wobble and then our KP tries to chase that. It's kind of a slower blub blub blub. Um, but it's, uh, it does go unstable and it's not very good for it, so yeah. that's a short test. Um, this is our derivative instability. As soon as you touch it, it goes unstable and it's uh, uh, also not good for it. So we just took that out. Now I'm going to pass it off to Tim. He's going to tell us about our test descriptions and our results. Thank you, Andy. So uh, to run the test on the air bearing table, it's pretty simple. Once we've got the table nice and clean, all the dust is off of there. The dust tends to collect on our air bearings and introduce friction into the system. So make sure it's nice and clean, level. We verify our motion capture and wireless communications are all up and running. Uh, and then we can air up the PSR uh, zero with this uh, alignment bar and then uh, let it go and see what happens. So here's what the robot looks like on the table. Um, you can see these red LEDs. Those are our phase-based motion capture LEDs. So each one is individually tracked. As you can see, uh, this is what it looks like in the phase-based software. Uh, in addition, the groups of LEDs on each link uh, redefine the rigid bodies in the software, and phase space uh, tracks the orientation and position of those for us. Um, here's a video of actual tests we performed. This is the data that I'll be analyzing came from this test. I'd like you to pay attention in particular to the orientation of the base uh, as the arms extend and contract. You can see it move just a few degrees. And so you can see that in the form of these red lines here. So this is our uh, PSR base orientation over time data from that test. Uh, there are two lines because we've added and subtracted seven degrees to the actual data um, and displayed that. That's kind of our balance for determining whether or not we've actually successfully recreated the motion uh, on the robotic platform. And so that blue line is the data from our robotic platform test. We don't have a video of that test, unfortunately. Um, and what you can see, it's, it's not exactly within the lines. Um, so our main culprit for this is, of course, our controller tuning. Um, the biggest difficulty is with KP low, you run into static friction. Uh, we're missing out on uh, we're sending you know, lower torque commands. We can't move it the way up you would expect. With KP high, we run into instability. So we're still trying to find that middle ground to make it work or to find some other workaround. Uh, on the right, you can see our uh, position error data. Uh, you can see that um, between the air bearing test and the uh, robotic platform test, there is a 14 centimeter drift between the two over a 30 second test. That's a lot. Um, um, but that comes in from the air bearing table. It's one of the challenges that we had with it. Uh, you couldn't really see it in that video, and we didn't see it while we were testing, but there is a 14 centimeter drift of the robot across the table over time, despite our best efforts to level it. And so that data wasn't very uh, usable for us. Some other challenges we had with the motion capture system, it's really good and pretty easy to use, um, but we do have data drop out here and there, so not all of the samples have all of the data that we need to track. And so we process the data carefully in MATLAB to make sure we're interpolating correctly and then all of our timestamps line up. Our air bearing table gets dusty, it requires some, uh, some careful maintenance. And because it is a large sheet of glass, there's inevitably a little bit of warping. So not every point on the table is uh, the same level as a different point on the table. So we have difficulty finding a sweet spot to really eliminate that positional drift. And that's something that still needs to be solved. Uh, in addition, because we are humans, trying to set a machine in a stable position on a frictionless environment, it, it's not possible for us to do. We need to find a way to do that. So there is a little bit of initial rotational drift that affects kind of the shape of that warp square wave you saw in the, in the previous data. Um, so now moving on to our specifications. I mentioned these earlier. These are what we defined to, uh, to really look for. In the interest of time, I'll focus on the ones that we didn't need. Um, we've got a question mark here because as you saw, our positional data on the air bearing table, it's not reliable. It's not something that we can so we're not sure about that specification yet. What I can tell you is that we didn't meet this specification. Uh, you saw that our data from the robotic platform test was not within the acceptable bounds, um, and that's something that still needs to be solved, unfortunately. Um, robotic platform physically works the way it should. And you'll notice as I go through, we have some of our older designs on these slides, just so you can see the evolution that we've uh, had to make this semester <coughs> to accommodate for some real world uh, situations. Um, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot making this one. We based this workspace off of a physical measurement of the Harada, what we thought to be the workspace last semester, and we wrote that spec. Uh, so it's too late to change it now, but we didn't account at the time for the fact that our limit sensors are not going to be at the physical uh, limits of the machine, and so our workspace is technically a little bit smaller than that, but it is big enough for us to do what we want to do. Um, uh, all of our sensors are there, and our, our software does run our specified frequencies on the Harada 1000 hertz. 
capture runs at the uh, captures data at the frequency we're looking for. Uh, and our user interface does most of what we're looking for. The one thing that we didn't include was the ability to uh, select individual join angles on the PSR as well as the momentum wheel uh, angular velocity. Uh, our two pointer space robots, you're looking at the second one right here. Uh, he's not in a position to be weighed yet, so we're not sure about our difference in mass parameters, unfortunately. So we used the same robot on the crown, both the robotic platform and the air bearing table crown, which is not ideal. Uh, we'd like to use this one in the future, and it's almost there. Uh, this last specification, in order to avoid damaging the torque force sensor, we wanted our PSR to be less than 100 kilograms. We just scraped by at 7 kilograms. <laughs> and we confirmed that we're not going to saturate any of the uh, sensors on our torque force sensor, which are useful for control, so that's good. In addition, we included a momentum wheel. Our initial analysis told us that the armature of the momentum wheel would be plenty uh, for us, but uh, we just found out kind of in the last few weeks, we had a breakthrough and found out that's not enough, so we'll be attaching a, a, a mass to that momentum wheel in order to get the acceleration we're looking for. All of our onboard electronics were successfully implemented, and our wireless communication frequency is plenty high. And as you saw, our air bearing uh, system works great, and uh, we were able to get that frictionless floating on the air bearing table. I'm going to give it back to Andy to wrap this up in the semester review. Okay. So I'm going to start off with our Gantt chart. Um, we follow this pretty well. We've definitely done everything on it. Um, it just, at the end, our, uh, our testing got pushed back because of a cascade of electrical explosions. And we were able to order, uh, order the parts that we needed and continue our testing and wrap up the project. All, all in all, uh, Worked out pretty well. This is our budget. Uh, we our budget was uh, six hundred fifty dollars. We went a little over uh, again because of the parts that failed. You can see we ordered sixteen below the loader drivers instead of ten or eleven like we initially planned, uh, and we ordered an additional momentum wheel and uh, an additional regulator. Uh, so that pushed us a little over. Uh, but at the end of it. We do have a complete, uh, well-iterated mechanical design, as you saw on the specifications. Uh, Lorenzo and the team have been uh, going back and forth and ironing out something that works. Uh, we have a verified electrical system. We uh, planned this all out on the breadboard, uh, tested the PCB extensively, and had a uh, trial by fire, literal fire. <laughs> uh, we have a robust and easily modifiable controller design. Because we've written every line of controller code, we haven't bought anything off the shelf, no servos or anything like that. It's completely open. Uh, you can go in and write anything you wanted uh, and implement it today. Uh, our if user interface is easily expandable. Um, it just, we have a template to add on more sub functions, and it takes about five minutes. Uh, we developed a really thorough suite of uh, post processing software in MATLAB uh, just to analyze what we were doing and figure out all of our. Uh, data and dimensions. Uh, and we also recommend plans for future work. It brings us to our project legacy. We're not the first people to work on this. We will not be the last, I don't think. I think Dr. Eisenberg is already making plans uh, to replace us. But one of the things that we, uh, we wanted to do was uh, we developed a full schematic of our system. Uh, this is ready to be made into a PCB. Uh, you don't really have to deal with this mess of wires at all. We tested this very thoroughly. We built it. Uh, incrementally and iteratively, and we made a few changes and it's ready to go. We could develop the PCB plug, plug in the components and I believe it would work. Uh, we did uh, develop our PSR PCBs. These are the easiest possible way to interface with the, between the Arduino and the motors and the sensors and vice versa. Uh, we do have our quick change sockets for our motor drivers. We swapped those out plenty. Um, and uh, if the need should arise, uh, those can be swapped out again. Our XB is also in the little uh, package, so you can pull that out, reprogram it, and put it back in as, uh, as you see the need. In addition, the Arduino is not permanent. If you fry your Arduino, you can take it out and uh, slap on a new one. Uh, as I said before, our control is completely custom. Uh, this is literally our line of code from our Arduino. Uh, it's just a simple PID. Uh, everything is white box. Uh, nothing is, uh, is off the shelf, and this is one of our early tests. Uh, little overshooting and it corrects with the integral controller. Uh, it was a blast to develop. And our user interface, this is the template I was talking about. Um, basically, you enter in a string literal and you say, okay, I want to arm the system. So you replace template with arm. Uh, this checks our enable pin. Uh, we regulate to 1,000 hertz. All of these functions are pre-made. All of the low-level work is done for the user already. Uh, so you never have to sit there and 
bit mask and bit shift and write supports like we did. So in addition, this is our, that keyboard hit I was talking about, all of our loops check the keyboard hit. If you panic, hit the keyboard, it'll stop. And so that's what we've left behind. And I believe that concludes our presentation. I would like to open it up for questions. Two questions just on the failures. So did you ever figure out why you regulated failed? Um, I think that when we swapped it to the new board, it was probably exposed to too much heat. Um, so I think that it was heat damaged from moving it from the broken board to the new board. Um, and honestly, so it did, it started smoking immediately when it was powered. Um, and then when we caught new, we checked the board, everything was shorting together and so I removed the regulator, continuity check again, and that was the problem. The board still worked fine, but it did um, damage the motor drivers. How much current did you have that regulator running at? From the... When it, when it, when not when it's breaking, but normally. <laughs> um, it, was, it was a pretty low current. It was less than 500 milliamps. It was, it was very low. Yeah, because you cleared the two amp max, but without a heat sink, you're not going to be up near that. Correct, yes. Yeah, it was, it was fairly low current throughout the entire Okay, and then the other question I had on the motor, you know, it sounds like you had some motor driver failures. Do you think you have those all sorted out, or there's still concerns that there might be a, an issue or a failure happens here or there? It sounds like you're proud of being able to swap them out, which is good. You want to be able to swap them out, but is it something that you're expecting to happen with regularity? Um, I, I don't anticipate that. Um, the five that were damaged on that broken board, once they were swapped, worked fine. The other one was actually damaged um, when we were scoping it, the scopes were shorted together on that one motor drive that was broken. Uh, so I burnt some, Tim burnt some. But, I, I burnt um, something like that too. Um, so that was why that was damaged. And then that one actually appeared to be working fine, which is why we implemented that test circuit, because um, it continuity checked fine, the voltage drops checked fine, but then it was absolute nonsense on the scope. So it wasn't actually outputting, even though it appeared to be working fine. So that was why we needed the scope to look at it. And it's the double-edged component of using cheap components. <laughs> uh, we have, these were under $5 a piece, um, so they're inexpensive to replace, but they are uh, a little on the lower end of things. So when you uh, had your air tank vibration, yes. did you do any uh, structural resonance testing to try and identify the frequency of these fibers? No, sir, I was gonna look at the force torque data um, and the, the encoder data, but it did not. If, if you had that information, what could you try? I, I would probably try to ban reject filter um, first, because I think that would be the easiest to pull in and code. Um, I think that's my only idea. Or not filter. Or not filter. Oh, yeah. Okay. Wasn't that? Yeah. Okay. So I noticed that you, your affinity for PID controllers, which I realized solve all control problems. <laughs> but let me back up a little and ask, why a PID first part? And then the second part, did you consider any other kind of controller? Uh, the, uh, with the PID on the, on the little robot, um, I think, honestly, it was probably because we could do it in the time that we had. Uh, we developed it last semester for the most part, uh, and then tweaked it when we actually added our masses onto it. We started out with just a proportional, and um, we saw the overshoot happen, and so we're like, okay, well, let's, let's go to a PD and, and we'll kill some of that overshoot with our, our damping. And, um, and then we looked at it, and there was a bunch of static friction in there, and so we thought, well, okay, let's take out the static friction with the integrators. And um, so that kind of evolved naturally. Uh, with the with the Harada, we, um, we did have those two papers um, that the previous group had published, and so I was reading those, and they used a PID. Looking at the code that they left over, they just had integral control with the proportional, um, and, which I hadn't seen. So I tried that, and I didn't get any good results. Um, and mostly, mostly we were looking at those linear controllers, um, but uh, I'm sure there are better. Thank you.
remote control. Um, <laughs> 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 Did have, um, we were planning on doing more system identification to get an accurate model that we could have linearized down to, to an accurate 